final showdown between Kenyan lawmakers and the Treasury Department is happening this week. On one hand, the account handlers want to increase the nation's revenue while the lawmakers are being mindful of the microeconomic impact on the purchasing power of the average Kenyan. Kenya's inflation rate has risen to 7.1% in May, and the central bank governor, that is Patrick Nguroje, believes it would soon exceed the Monetary Policy Committee's goal range of 25 to 7.5%. Housing, water, electricity, gas, fuel, and others, which accounts for about 14.6% of the inflation basket, increased by 6%. And according to Gladys Wanga, the chairwoman of the legislature's finance committee, during a session in the National Assembly last week, she said that Kenyan consumers have been paying 16% VAT on gas for almost a year. She further explained that the lawmakers also rejected the National Treasury's plan to double the digital service tax to 3%, saying the additional costs will be passed on to users. And now, a threshold for digital services companies to register for value-added tax was set at a turnover of 5 million shillings. That's about $42,789 to protect the very small businesses. And some consensus have been uh, achieved as we speak, and this will ratify this week and later will be sent to the president, that is Uhuru Kenyatta, for assent. So today we are talking about Kenyan lawmakers pushing back on treasury tax proposals. And this is Business Edge. I am Nikon on Nobanjo, standing in for Tulu Lope Adelero Balogo. You're welcome. And joining me from Nairobi, Kenya, is Ali Khan Sachu, Africa Jew economist and macro analyst, and also CEO, Bridge Management. It's a beautiful time and, of course, a beautiful season to have you join us. I'm Ali Khan, right here on Business Edge once again. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Let's uh, get uh, down into the discussion for today. Now, according to reports, we understand that Kenya's inflation uh, rose by 7.1% in May. And the country's central bank uh, believes that it will soon exceed the MP's goal range of between 2.5% uh, to about 7.5%. So the question is, can this actually be reversed or paused? So, you know, the inflation rate uh, uh, has been in this corridor for quite a while. However, um, as we're probably going to discuss, the government has been subsidizing, for example, the price of fuel, um, the price of electricity in some respects, and that has suppressed the inflation rate. And a lot of people feel that the basket is not reflecting the inflation rate accurately. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a complex puzzle um, at the moment. But uh, my overall impression is that the report of Inflation rate is understating the uh, experience rate of inflation on the ground. All right, now, Ali Khan, aside from actually raising the benchmark interest rates, now tell us how else do you think uh, Kenya can actually curb inflation in the country? Actually, I think Kenya is running out of options. Uh, the strategy that the government of Kenya has used until now is to subsidize things like fuel which is currently costing the government $66 million a month. Uh, there have been further, further subsidies in the uh, electricity sector. And I think this strategy is not a sustainable economic policy. And therefore, we're going to have to return uh, to um, a monetary policy. And actually, this is a phenomenon I think many central banks are going to be grappling with the world over. Um, globally, I believe interest rates are far too low when you compare it to the inflation rates that we're experiencing. This experiment of money printing and MMT has, uh, has exhausted its shelf life. And we've got to return to good old-fashioned monetary policy making, which means the rate of, rate of interest, uh, interest rate policy, has to go back to neutral, which means that you look at your inflation rate and you have to go significantly higher in order to break the back of the inflation rate. Therefore, I think in Kenya, we saw this reaction of a rate hike after many years 
of no movement. And I think that essentially is the signal in the noise that we're going to have to see higher interest rates um, and also uh, in order to make sure that we keep foreign investment money attracted in the country. Otherwise, you're going to see a lot of flight capital. In Nigeria, of course, you boxed everybody in so they couldn't get out, but that's not an optimal uh, policy, frankly. All right, uh, still talking about inflation and, of course, the reaction of um, the Kenyan lawmakers. Uh, we understand that basic amenities, the price of basic amenities, have risen by about 6%. And you've also talked about how flawed um, this issue is. So tell me, do you think the reaction by the lawmakers, uh, would you consider it as wise and swift? Do you think that they are uh, being wiser when it comes to tackling inflation and standing up to say that they want to block or cut on tax increase in any of its form? So that's a really good question. As you probably know, we're 100 days away from the election here in Kenya. So I think lawmakers and politicians uh, are trying to mitigate this cost of living increase as much as possible because they're cognizant that they're going to have to face the electorate. And whether it's in Kenya or the world over, um, this cost of living increase is, is, is creating a political crisis. So I think at least what we can take away from this is that Kenyan lawmakers are sensitive to what's going on in the real economy and to what's going on amongst their constituents. However, the problem now is, is overwhelming, and this is a short-term band-aid because the country is overborrowed, uh, the funds uh, were not spent, I would say, as wisely as they could have been, and therefore, the debts are coming home to roost. And in that environment, uh, the knee-jerk reaction is to keep lifting taxes. But the challenge is you reach a point, it's the Laffer curve, when you can't raise taxes any further. Your collection is not going to increase. And I think the Kenya government is not far from that point. So it's a, it's a, it's a real conundrum. But I think the, uh, the lawmaker's response has been is part is part in great part because of having to face the electorate in less than a hundred days. All right, now um, Ali Khan, we understand that um, Kenyans are paying more to purchase gas. So let's say if Kenya decides to purchase gas from um, African countries that are producing that commodity, uh, talk of uh, Tanzania or DRC, do you think it would actually reduce the cost uh, the, the cost of purchasing that particular commodity? So that's a very good question. I think, you know, uh, uh, many of our countries, including Kenya, are very inefficient um, in terms of the acquisition of basic commodities of which gas is a component. There is, I mean, you know, Tanzania, I recall when the Tanzanian president visited, uh, they made a big push to supply uh, gas into the Kenyan market. The problem in Kenya is that uh, the distribution is, is a monopoly. And the margins and the profits that are, in, that are accruing to that uh, a monopolistic distributor are egregious. So what you've got, and I think this is a symptom of a disease not, we, we see not only in Kenya, but many other parts of Africa, is we have a very inefficient system, a system which does not allow to try, us to transmit lower prices easily. So yes, you can get uh, cheap wholesale gas out of Tanzania, but you have got to identify the supply chain and understand where you need to bring pressure to bear. And quite often, where you have to bring pressure to bear um, is with extremely well-connected individuals politically. Um, and it's very difficult to do those reforms about which I'm talking. But yes, uh, overall, you would think that if we can get the gas from Tanzania, we should be saving tremendous costs, and I think we would. Hmm. All right, let's talk about uh, another related commodity, which is um, actually crude oil. Now, how much of local refining capacity does um, Kenya have? And um, do you think that if there's some sort of um, consortium or a joint refining project coming up for Kenya, do you think it would actually um, reduce the burden of um, refining this uh, crude oil? So it's a good point uh, you're making, and uh, again, this is a problem that we are facing all over the continent, that we simply don't have enough refining capacity. 
Um, and, you know, even oil producing countries uh, like Angola and Nigeria are importing refined product. Um, and this is obviously suboptimal. Kenya is no exception. So we do have some refining capacity, but it's, it's nothing significant. Um, uh, so we're importing most of our crude oil, Merban crude from the United Arab Emirates. Um, and yes, I mean, you know, there is an opportunity here as well um, to look at refinery, refinery capacity and to look at it not only in country, but also regionally, uh, East African community could be uh, one area that we think of as, as the market size. Um, so yes, again here, uh, another big opportunity. A lot of people also asking themselves, why would you also be exporting, for example, example Ugandan crude when you have you know, a significant amount of demand within the region? So yes, we've got to look at these structures around our primary commodities, both exports and imports, and we've got to optimize and, and see how we can make it more efficient. So um, finally, um, Ken, before we go on a break, we understand that the fact that um, African countries not having um, a refining or a refinery, so to speak, it's like a recurring decimal, most especially in so many African countries. Now, why is that so? Uh, why is it a big deal that it can be dealt with? Some other African countries that have um, refineries, uh, some of these refineries have gone moribund. So it seems like a plague, so to speak. And it's, uh, we have oil uh, in Africa. So why is it that that becomes a challenge that it seems that African countries cannot or have not been able to overcome? So, you know, I, I've, I've thought about this uh, a lot. and uh, Basically, it's not rocket science. Um, admittedly, refinery costs are high capex, um, but really the savings that would accrue would pay for the high capex. And I think this comes down to the political economy. In the sense that whether you, when you're an oil exporter, there are profits to be made by just selling the barrels. There are profits to be made and commissions to be paid on importing the refined product. And it is all part of this political economy that I'm describing. Until we resolve our political economy, I cannot believe we're going to resolve this challenge. Mm. And in the nature of it is the, the amount of money that's accruing from this export of the raw commodity and re-import of the refined product is so big that it may, means that the money that can be thrown around is so large that that is what is stopping, I believe, mm -hmm. us developing a proper sophisticated economy which refines its own oil product, whatever it might be. All right, so uh, we'll quickly go on a break, Ali Khan. When we return, we'll look at the electorates. Um, that is the citizens of Kenya now, because, of course, election is coming up. We'll see how that would affect their voting pattern. So stay with us. Now, uh, Kenyan lawmakers are seeking to cut or block proposed tax increases on key items, including cooking gas and digital services, to actually curb inflation ahead of August elections. Uh, they also agreed that a proposal to triple the capital gains tax to 15% should be approved now is it achievable would that be achievable and what impact will those have on the country's economy and the electorates when they take to the polls in august definitely the conversation will continue but then a break will do for now we'll be back Kenyan lawmakers are pushing back on treasury tax proposals and on business edge today. Ali Khan Sachu, an Africa geoeconomist, macro analyst and CEO of region uh, management has been our guest on the show. So um, let's go back to you, Ali Khan. Looking at the trends now, rising living costs are said to be huge on the minds of um, citizens in the East Africa nation, even as they prepare for the for the polls, uh, which will happen on August 9th. So tell us, do you think this trend and all this back and forth between uh, the Treasury, um, the account handlers, the Treasury, and of course um, the lawmakers in Kenya would affect the voting pattern uh, when the election comes? That's a very interesting question. Um, uh, and clearly, um, uh, it's, inc it's incredible how little uh, both sides uh, have, have really been speaking to this issue. Um, admittedly, the Deputy President talks about wheelbarrow economics, and I think he's 
basically talking about how to help people at the bottom of the pyramid. But, you know, nobody has really come up with an economic response to deal with the cost of living crisis, in my view. Um, it, seemed, it, it feels as if uh, the politicians are trying to kick the can down the road and then hopefully get through the election and then see uh, what, what they will have to do. And I'm afraid by doing that, the gate had to deal with the problem, um, which is coming at the same time as, as a debt uh, overhang. So it's really a double whammy and it's going to be a very difficult problem. Definitely on the ground, this is the subject about which everyone is speaking. Um, it's quite extraordinary uh, uh, how this, you know, how, how much people are speaking about it, but also extraordinary is the divorce between the political discourse and this discourse on the ground. Will it affect um, uh, uh, the outcome of the election? I think um, it's very it's very curious because you know we have here um, a, a president supporting the erstwhile opposition candidate. We have his deputy um, uh, who is who is who is in a in a competition mm. with the president and the erstwhile opposition candidate. So in a way, when you're trying to pin blame, it becomes a little bit difficult because you know who do you pin blame on? Uh, you know, do you pin blame on the uh, outgoing president, you hmm. pin blame on the deputy. It, 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 it's it's quite a political. It's quite confusing politically. But I do think the subject is is going to be more and more important as we approach the election. Oh, and yeah. uh, so far, you know, the uh, the, the Rhino Dinga is proposing some kind of stipend, but this is not affordable. I mean, you know, no one is thinking uh, beyond beyond the promise and 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 understanding that you can't deliver these promises and that essentially they're going to be meaningless. All right, uh, there's been, been this clamor that uh, bioethanol stoves, um, essentials like fertilizer, corn flour, staple food, and some other sundries should actually be in exempted from um, value added tax. Do you also um, think in that direction? Yes, I do. And I think, you know, for, for a long time, uh, they were largely exempt. And um, it speaks to the, the cash crunch of the Treasury that, you know, the, these uh, these uh, taxes have been imposed. You know, think about fertilizer. Fertilizer, we're, we have a large part of our economy is dependent on agriculture. Um, uh, we've got a global food crisis that's now hitting us all. And if you are taxing fertilizer, which means less fertilizer will be used in the farms, which will be less productive, you're in many regards shooting yourself in the foot. Then, in terms of you know staple food, um, uh, making it more expensive is also, uh, I think, not helpful. But I think you know this speaks to the pressure the treasury is under um, to raise to raise money, and uh, it, it's it's an unfortunate situation and a catch twenty two. Now, let's quickly look at um, tax placements as contained in the proposal, and let's see w w what you make of it. Now, imported cellular phones uh, should be subjected to 10% excise duty, 20% uh, tax uh, should be imposed on digital, digital lenders fees, and 7.5% um, tax on betting, gaming, uh, prize competitions, and lottery. So tell us, um, do you think that um, these taxes on all these variables are well placed? Okay, so imported phones, um, really in this day and age, you can manufacture phones. So I think I don't see that as, uh, as a, a challenge. I think it's, it, it works with a strategy of trying to encourage uh, manufacturing in country. Uh, digital loans, I think, you know, these are already the most expensive loans that you can possibly take out. I mean, you know, they run into on an annualized APR basis, you're talking about well in excess of you know, above 100%. And the majority of people taking these loans are those who can least afford it. Um, uh, so I think this is a very punitive uh, measure. And I think it will, you know, you'll get cost passed through into, into the customers. And the customers, I feel, can least afford to be paying these kinds of interest rates. So from a policy perspective, I think this is very retrogressive. And I think it should be stopped. And then I think, um, what was your third question uh, regarding? 
Yes, uh, that, uh, that's about 7.5% tax on betting games and other prize competitions. Yeah, so, you know, betting uh, became crazy in this country, really. Everyone was betting um, uh, billions of uh, 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 dollars have been, have been spent. And I think the government saw it as a cash cow. But uh, again, here, I think you're better off, um, uh, instead of punishing it from a tax side, trying to reduce um, uh, the overall betting culture within the society. Um, by taxing it more, you're recognizing you know, that it's, that it's a possible cash cow. And I don't think that's a good idea. Hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Alekan Sachu, for being part of Business Edge once again. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure for me. Thank All right. you. Thank you, too. Now, um, a final vote on a finance bill that adjusted the tax regime is scheduled for, uh, for this week, definitely. And once approved, it will be sent to the president to sign it into law. Whether or not the citizens would be cut some slack and benefit from the remains is yet to be seen. And that would definitely be after the bill has been finalized. So let's quickly go for a break. And when we return to the time for NC4 to watch, do stay with us. Let's quickly bring you NC4 to watch. Looking at the top stories in the business world now. Tea prices at Kenya's Mombasa auction held below the set minimum price as demand remains subdued at the weekly trading with the onset of summer in key export markets. The price of the beverage in last week's trading increased marginally to $2.29. That's about 268 shillings from $2.23, which is about 261 shillings in the previous sale, well below the government's set reserve cost of $2.43 a kilo. Elsewhere, according to information from the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority, the regulators say it will present an air transport license to the interim management of Nigeria's national carrier, that is Nigeria Air, on Monday, which is today, barring any unanticipated changes in plans. Airlines are granted an air transport license that allows them to perform scheduled and non-scheduled services. A trip to Egypt now. At December 2021, Egypt is said to be owing $145.5 billion external debt. This is an increase of $7.7 .7 billion compared to June 2021. Despite the rise in net disbursements of loans and facilities uh, by $9.1 billion, the depreciation of the other currencies comprising the external debt exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar led to a decrease of $1.4 billion in book value and finally iron ore topped up its biggest weekly gain in 13 weeks as traders tracked china's moves to rein in covid 19 restrictions that have weighed on steel demand this quarter now futures in singapore crept higher on monday morning after surging more than seven percent last week on optimism over china's plans to get the economy moving again after sweeping lockdowns and that's it on Business Edge for today. Do not forget that you can visit our social media platforms at New Central TV. You can also download our mobile app on App Store and Play Store and visit www.newcentral.africa for more stories there. My name is Likon Obanjo. Have a wonderful Monday. <laughs>